You're listening to Go with Jamarlin Martin. We have a go hard or go home approach as we talk to the leading tech leaders, politicians, and influencers. Let's go. Today we have Deshaun Amira. Uh, welcome to the Go Show. Thanks for having me. A little bit about Deshaun. I was really happy to get this interview. You know, we've in, we've interviewed entrepreneurs across America, black entrepreneurs across America, and the consensus I got in the community was, hey, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they get a lot of press, get a lot of buzz. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of headlines. But the consensus I got was you're the real deal, mm. that you're the, the man kind of with a really strong business that has momentum. You have the fundamentals down. Mm-hmm. Why isn't there more press about you? I haven't sought a lot of press. Um, and not because, you know, I'm like really, really some like master strategist and it's like all some big plan to be quiet about things. But, um, you know, I've always just been sort of, you know, I'm just sort of quiet when I, when I work and I like to, I like to do things. And then after I do them, um, then talk about them. Um, and then I often find myself even after I do a thing feeling like, it's not good enough. I need to get to the next level. I want to do another thing. Um, and then I'll talk about stuff. Um, but I've also found that all the attention from press is very distracting and generally is not that good for whatever your core metric or KPI in your business is, which usually is customers and sales. Yeah. Um, and like press does not always equal sales um and a lot of it can be very seductive and gets you into feeling like you're the man because you got you know you're on like a magazine cover or you're you're getting you're getting accolades and people writing about you and talking about you and then next thing you know people are calling you and you're going on the road and you're talking at shows and and you're on the circuit and you're not in the office um and so that can hurt an early stage entrepreneur to not be focused and not have your eye on the ball. So I've come to look at press as much more strategic and it's really about how exactly is press going to drive forward the business? Like, you know, I'm a lot of the stories that people want to discuss um, or the press has wanted to talk about with me has been about fundraising and these are like mainstream, uh, mainstream um, publications, um, you know, Forbes and Fortune and these these type of things. And they want to they want to their audience that they're speaking to is a business crowd. Um, that story is interesting and that story is cool. But my customers are not necessarily reading that that magazine. They're not that does not translate into more people saying, oh, I should go buy more hair from Maven. So. Um, you know, so I've just generally looked at the opportunities for press and then I've said, is this going to help or is this not going to help? Um, and then I've also found that like the mainstream press, they would prefer to focus on that story than talk about the actual business. And so that kind of also, that was a little annoying to me, actually. Do you think it's a coincidence that in terms of valuation and momentum, the most meaningful traction mm-hmm. among founders that yeah. look like us yeah and you're not looking for press and you, but when you started you weren't looking for press yeah do you think that there's a there's any correlation between the two the fact that you are relatively with other entrepreneurs i would call you very light pr uh-huh. relative to yeah. the traction you have yeah yeah is it a coincidence um no i think there's a correlation yeah. i think there's a correlation i think I think, I think if you stay out of the 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 fray, you're gonna be more focused. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing press, and you're doing it not for the 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 sole purpose of attracting more customers, then you're probably wasting your time as it relates to the business. You might be getting like more popular, right? that could be a benefit for you personally, but it's not necessarily going to benefit the business. So I do think for me, there has definitely been a correlation. What's the origin of your last name? Oh, 
my last name is uh it's a whole story what's the story yeah yeah, yeah yeah so um it's not my mom or my dad's last name so my uh i'm mixed half black half white my mother's ancestry is jewish russian jewish uh my father's black um so they were both like bay area hippies and you know revolutionaries and uh when I was born, my dad did not want to give me the slave name. And his last name is Wiley. Um, and we were a really big family on that side, too. He's got like 12, 13 brothers and sisters. Um, so they wanted to just like give me my own name. Um, so he took a word from Swahili, and my mom took a word from Russian, and they like put them together and made my last name. And that's what it's it is. A, <laughs> so I, it's not. I, so, I would probably yeah. argue there's probably some correlation there. That yeah. You had a father that said, "I cannot give my son a slave name." Yeah, I mean, I didn't. Um, honestly, growing up and as a kid, it was just frustrating because it was. I was confused by like, why is my last name? All these other kids, their last name is their parents' last name, and people would get confused at school and on forms and stuff like that. They're like, who's your dad? Who's your mom? Um, but when I, you know, as I got older, I came to like appreciate that, you know, and yeah. appreciate the way that they looked at the way they looked at me and the way they looked at what they expected for me, which was to just kind of be completely my own person. Did your first investors know that you were half Jewish? My first. Yeah. Your first so, seed round. Well, so first of all, I want to just give credit to who my actual real first investors were, which were two black women that I knew from like my college years. Um, I studied abroad in Tokyo when I was in when I was a sophomore. I went to Hampton and um, there was another uh, student on the same program who she was coming from Spelman. And she was like a year ahead of me. Ridiculously smart uh, woman. And we got really cool, became friends, we're still friends. And when we, when I, like, this is probably, you know, that was 2001. So, you know, 2012, 13, when I told, I told her I'm going to, like, I got this idea for this thing. She was like, D, you got to do that, I'll invest. And um, she ended up giving me $10,000 and her best friend gave me $10,000. That was like, those were my first investors. Got it. Um, and, you know, I'm very, and I'm very proud of that. Wow. So they, they got to be sitting on a, a nice They're paper sitting game. nice. They're sitting nice. They give, so As they should black be. Women, yeah. Black women. Black women started women, yeah. this company. Yeah. yeah. Black women lifted me up and put me in the game. For the audience, explain what Maven does and okay. how you came up with the idea. Maven, you know, it exists because I wanted to empower the community to have more ownership over the beauty market that we support and we pump billions and billions and billions of dollars into. Um, I, I used to live in China uh, after college. I moved to China. I was there for like two years and I had been importing products for, you know, since 2003. I just started buying stuff off the street in China and I would send it back home and people would sell it for me, send me the money back. And then that turned into like a full on business where I was just like buying containers of everything furniture art clothing i would import it back to like miami or atlanta had a warehouse i would post stuff on craigslist i had a showroom and i was just like hustling like no order to to it no structure it was just like cash in a backpack go to china give them some money watch them load up my container meet the thing meet the the, the you know the container at the port bring all my shit to the warehouse, post some ads on Craigslist. Do you credit street game out of the, the Bay in terms of, yeah, you went to college, but are you bringing more street game to the table than your average entrepreneur at this stage in terms of you just want to go get it? You know, you're, you're doing this business with China and you're just kind of trying to make it happen. I How mean, I would, of, I yeah. would definitely say I've always had a mentality of um, sell something. I've just, I've always, you know, that was a very, uh, to me, empowering and liberating thing to do was to be able to sell something and make some money from it. And so, you know, the Bay, that definitely, you know, put some of that, that spirit in me. Um, and then honestly, 
I got a lot of my hustle from China. Yeah. I mean, I lived in China for two years and I never seen people hustling. What parts of like uh, that. China? Shenzhen, okay. Shanghai. You know, I saw a level of hustle and a level of like willing to do whatever it takes over there that I had never seen before. And an energy of people pulling themselves out of the mud and doing anything they could to sell something. Yeah. To make some more money. And, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the hustle of China. And China's where they are today, you know, because of that. So I got a lot of my game from China as well. Yeah, so I went to uh, Beijing and Shanghai in uh, 2008, and uh, the food sucked. At least my experience. In where? where? Uh, Beijing and Shanghai. Okay. Okay, you and just, I, t- I talked to other folks. You just there. didn't. So I, I, they didn't yeah, take yeah. you to the right place. So you had the right places from no, the start. No, because yeah. the Chinese food in China is crazy. It's yeah. ridiculously good. But you just have to go to the right place. Yeah. And you, I mean, if you, you go you, to the wrong place, it's going to really, really when be When you wrong. first got there, it's you were going to the right places. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of nowhere in the middle. Like You're either going to get like the best Chinese food you've ever had in your life that you just can't get here. Yeah, our guide was, uh, I guess, taking us to some really uh, funny uh, places. This is one place I just remember. Yeah. They had prawns, <laughs> and when I saw the prawns, uh, they, did, it had they, all, they had all they this did, stuff on it. It was it very was, crispy. Yeah. It just wasn't, yeah. Right, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, right. No, no Kung Pao. Yeah. Oh, we didn't have the general souls. You're hustling, and yeah. what's the next step? Okay, so uh, anyway, I said all that to say that like my background is really in like supply chain and China and importing and distribution. Hair came along. You know, I became kind of like the guy that everybody knew. You know, all my friends knew me as like the guy who could get you stuff from China. So I always had people calling me, hey, D, can you get scooters from China? Hey, can you get whatever from China? Can you get, you know... I've imported all kind of shit. Like, you wouldn't even... You'd be like, what the hell? How are you importing? I've imported slabs of granite. You know, I've imported uh, jet skis. um, You know, clocks. Paintings. Everything. So, which all just came from, like, people calling me and be like, hey, can you get this stuff? And so that sent me all over China. I would just be, like, traipsing through middle of nowhere looking for these factories and just going into factories and, and talking to these guys. So that was really like my skill set was that I could really I could really work that side of the world. And after, you know, fast forward, like I moved back from China. I was importing stuff. I went back to school. I did an MBA, came back, moved back to the Bay, and I wanted to start something. And, I, and by that time, I knew I wanted to start something that was going to connect the internet with all the things I was doing. Um and I had discovered around that time, like 07, you know, this is when like Facebook was like going bonkers and became like this really big story. And actually, like, by, at, at, you know, that time, I didn't know about Silicon Valley, even though I grew up like 40 minutes from there. And then I saw that like, oh, shit, like there's this place over here. 40 minutes from where I'm from and they're just like they're like handing out 10 million dollar checks to like kids are you from the hood hood in no. terms of the section no no born in the hood hood but moved out very early like when I was five um and I was very fortunate to be raised in like the Oakland Hills yeah so you know but I didn't grow up in a very like business oriented family like they're very like social justice education overthrow the system you know overthrow the system like corporate is like <laughs> yeah. bad yeah you know that was the like ethos I was raised in but ironically it was like be yourself and be free you know it was like an ethos of like be liberated and what I saw was that being free and being liberated in this world meant you had to have your own and you need to be in control of your or or you will be you will be in somebody else's building at their cubicle, making them making them money. So that kind of translated into an entrepreneurial uh, mind state for me. You know, I did my MBA. I moved back. I was trying to look for what I wanted to do. I knew I did not want to go work at a company and I needed brain space so I could think and I could test and try different things to figure out what I wanted to do. So I took like 
um, I took like really menial jobs uh, right after I finished my MBA. So I was like valeting cars, um, you know, doing yard work. I did the, um, I did a bunch of little weird random ass jobs. Like I was, uh, you know, those guys that they're, they're called surveyors. The guys that are like out in the middle of the street, yeah. and like looking through that little thing. And you're like, yeah. what the fuck? What is that shit? Yeah. So I learned what that was. Did that for a little while. Uh, I did whatever I could to just like keep money in my pocket, but also have like the rest of the day free for me to think and figure out what I wanted to do. And then somebody called me um, in my family, hairstylist. She asked me if I could help her get some hair extensions from China. And so I did that to help her out, brought back these hair extensions, brought it to some hair salons. The salons were like, oh, this is fire. Can you get some more? And then that turned into me like just... This was like another easier way for me to make a little bit of money while I think about what it is that I want to do. So next thing I know, I'm like selling hair out the trunk of my car to all these hairstylists in Oakland. And um, the deeper I got into that, that's when like this thing started to percolate in my head. Um, And it didn't start with like it didn't start with some sort of affinity to hair or beauty. What really kicked it off was like, I'm driving around, I'm selling these hairstylists this hair, and it's blowing my mind that they don't sell it, right? Like, the volume of this hair that's moving through these salons um, is in the billions, but the salons themselves were not the ones selling it. The customers were going to this beauty supply store across the street, buying it, and then bringing it to the hair salon. And then like, 95% of all the beauty supply stores are owned by Koreans. So, like, you literally just only have outbound. Like, the cash is all outbound out of the community. None of it is is inbound. We're just buying it. The stylists are just installing it and putting it in, working with it, but they're not making any money off of it. And And they're referring all these customers to go over to the store and buy it. So, feeding the, the, feeding the store. But the store not kicking anything back. Are you doing this uh, just in the Bay at this point? Yeah, this is just, I'm selling, this is like in Oakland. I'm just selling hair out of the trunk of my car to stylists. Like too short was selling tapes. Yeah. 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 Like every, you know, like, you know, all a great American entrepreneur, like they sell it out of the trunk. And I tell people that all the time, like you got to sell it, just sell it first. You know, like that's the foundation of everything. You know, if I didn't go sell it, I wouldn't know these things. People want to get a deck and get a meeting. They want to get sell. a deck yeah. and a meeting and go raise a million dollars yeah. and, you know, do all these things and build the website and do all these things before you go get a customer yeah. to even validate that you even have a good idea. Does that make you more bearish in terms of negative that this economic cycle in tech is going to turn because you see so many people out there that don't care about customers and product and getting validation. They don't care about profits and fundamentals that there's a lot of fluff out there in the market. And as you know, sometimes that signals that you're going to have a turn in the cycle, that this thing is going to bust. It will bust. You know, it will. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's just, and it's just cyclical because there's always... There's always a fluff and there's always waves and then there's a buildup of fluff. And then but do you see? Cause you're, like right now? Yeah, you're, you're right there in the belly of the beast in Silicon Valley. Do you see a lot of fluff out there? Yeah, yeah. of course. But I always have. I don't, yeah. you know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I'm like the best at like reading the macroeconomic trend and to be able to tell you when the, the, the tide's going to turn and when the thing's going to, you know, pop. But I definitely see it's going to happen. You see a massive amount of fluff. For sure. Yeah. For sure. That's, and that's the game. That's like in every game. Like yeah. when the money starts getting easy, then all the, all the little tricksters start coming. And all the like try to get it easy type people start coming when the money is flowing. You know? Are you so, seeing any tightening of financing uh, conditions where investors are smartening up and kind of not kind of being as loose with their wallet as they were maybe three, four years prior? No, not really. Yeah. I would I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say so. Yeah. I'm fortunate also to have like t- some fantastic investors that don't go with whatever like the wave is. You know, they're pretty disciplined about how they do things. Yeah. Whether 
the market is this or the market is that they've kind of got the way they they will look at and they'll be more disciplined about the way they look at, at things so and those people have the most interaction with but no i wouldn't say right now there's like a tightening not yeah. that i can see uh let's go on uh so maven okay you're actually so i'm selling the hair and i'm just like this is crazy like why are we you know like it's like we're getting robbed that's when like my upbringing in like social justice combined with my hustle mentality sort of converged and i was like these stylists have all these customers and they have the relationship with all these customers they should be the ones selling it if i could give them a platform that made it easy for them to do this without them having to invest capital and manage inventory and all this stuff we could unlock and build an enormous distribution channel for our products and both sides of me would be satisfied in this equation. I would be helping my community and we could build a big ass business. And that like really like lit me up that we could do both at the same time. And that so much of the business relied on an expertise that I had that was like, you know, I had been building that domain expertise of like importing and sourcing from China for 10 years by the time I started this. So, and that was like a critical piece. And so, you know, I have, I had, by that time, I had really started to understand that, like, you got to choose. There's what you like, there's, th there's like, might be like what you love and what you're passionate about. Then there's what you're good at. And there's what you have an advantage at. And the thing that you're good at and you have an advantage at, in my opinion, is like your gift and you invest in your gift. And so that excited me that like, man, who else can do this? Like I, I like, I don't know any other like black dudes in that speak Chinese and go to China and can do all this stuff and can work the street level. Yeah, I read that you even had hairstylists in your family. So yeah. you had some education yeah. in your family yeah. about this business. Yeah. And, when I was reading your story, I've known this about other entrepreneurs, but I, you, uh -huh. I felt like you were the only one mm. in the world uh. that could build this business because of your history, your family. That's your how parents, I pitched it, and that's how yeah. I, and that's how I felt, and that's how I pitched it, yeah. and I and I felt like because of that, I was even more obligated to do it. Like if I don't build this thing, who else is gonna tie all these different things together? Who's going to pull China together with the streets, with Silicon Valley, you know, and the black community? Who's going to pull it all together? And like, I just, I happen to have like this amazing constellation of like experiences and resources to be able to do this exact thing. Most of the hair comes from India. I think the, the misconception is that, um, you know, India is not a mass exporting and manufacturing economy. China is the manufacturing and export economy. Like their entire the infrastructure capital. over there is set the up Mecca. to make shit and export it, right? Which is an incredible amount of infrastructure. So, you know, India doesn't have all of that set all that set up the way that China has it set up. So what has so the way the hair business works is the majority of all of that hair, I mean, it all comes from India, but it gets shipped to China as a raw material. And then the Chinese factories turn it into the finished, the finished good and then export it out of there. You're kind of putting the stuff together and you start figuring out kind of what Silicon Valley is about. Yeah. How do you get your investor meetings? Man, I've just been so fortunate, man, to like meet amazing people along the way who have, who have like, just pushed us forward, but like, uh, it was this, uh, this friend of mine who I'd met around that time who, he was working at Zynga, and Zynga just went public, and he was saying, uh, he was like really into what I was trying to do, and he's like, yo, I'm gonna give you like 15, 15 grand. Um, some happened or whatever, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. You know, Zynga had a, there was a bunch of stuff went on there. And he called me, he's like, hey, listen, I can't do it, but 
my mom, I told my mom about it. And my mom is like, I don't even know him, but I'm gonna give him $15,000 to do this. He has to do that business. Another black woman that put me in the game, didn't even know me and said, that needs to exist. And she sent me $15,000. So, you know, so now, like, all this stuff's piling up to where it's like, I'm the only one who could do this. I got people who don't have a lot giving me a lot. Okay, this is, so this is it. So I'm just sticking with this. This is it. I'm taking this thing all the way. Like, I'm, I'm obligated. And that's what, like, excited me. So, um... You know, I got that first, you know, that was like $40,000. And then uh, I went to all these pitch events. So I didn't really know anything about Silicon Valley either by this time. So I knew that my next kind of big hurdle was crack that. So go figure out Silicon Valley. And I looked at Silicon Valley like it was like China. Like it's another culture. It's another country i would never been to. They speak a different language. I need to figure out, I need to hit the ground and figure out how they talk so I can figure out what their culture is, right? And when I say how they talk, I don't mean like, oh, what, like how they pronounce stuff. I mean, like when you learn people's languages, you learn, you learn their culture. You learn things ab about what drives and motivates them and where the, the origins of certain ideas and beliefs and things that they have, a lot of that can be learned from the way that people talk. And, and the conversations that are had. And so um, I would just go to every tech event. I just went to every single one. I would just sit there and I would just listen. I would listen to the panels and listen how they talk about business and you know how they talked about marketing and how they talked about sales and how they talked about product and you know, lean startups and all this kind of stuff, started learning these, like, these ideas. It would started to kind of tell me, okay, I, I see, I'm starting to see how they see the world. Yeah, for the audience, what year are we in here? 2011 or 12. Okay. So then that led to me saying, okay, I got to put a deck together. And, and sort of understanding that the idea was go and try to build some sort of little prototype of this thing to demonstrate it could work at all. And then put that into a deck and then go and try to like talk to these guys. I started my first like process of trying to like make a deck. And a lot of that was like throwing out all the shit that I had learned in business school. Because business schools don't really teach you about Silicon Valley and like that culture of business there. I, I was used to like, okay, I got to make a 40 page business plan. Silicon Valley, it's like, man, I need a 10-page deck with as few words as possible. Show me charts, graphs, and the relevant information, and for me to just get excited that there's an opportunity here, and then we go. So I had to relearn, relearn that and like simplify what is, a, in my mind, I'm thinking of all the different moving parts or whatever, and they're like, I don't want to see all that shit. Give me a 10-page deck. So I started doing that. I went to the Oakland Small Business Development Center, and they helped me for free to make models, to make the deck. Meanwhile, I started going to these pitch events. When I got the deck complete, I would start to go to pitch events and start learning how to pitch. And I, I turned out to be very good at pitching, and I would even like win some pitch events. Like the first pitch event I went to, I won. But then, I, but then there would be people on the panel who were like, that sounds amazing. But I don't know anything about black hair, black women. I can't invest. But I support you. You get a lot of like, the market's too small. I mean, white folks, like, hey, you're... you're I mean... It's a niche. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that. There's definitely a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I think that the, you know, the words black women is... Double it, niche. Yeah, and it's it, in the mind of, you know you know, the mass, mass culture, it's, it's minimal. Yeah. Right. It's minimized, you know, just those, you know, black women, it's minimized all around when in actuality, black women are not like, not only like economically a supernova in size, 
but then just culturally drive so much of everything that we do. That was always very frustrating because people would just instinctually be like, oh, it's small, it's niche. So there was a lot of that. And a lot of like, I don't get it, but I like what you're saying. Like, it makes sense, but I don't know anything about this world, so I can't give you any money, but I'll support you. You know, I know this other guy, go to this pitch event or whatever, you know, so people were doing what they could within the confines of like what they, you know, their comfort levels were, uh, you know, with stuff. So ultimately, somebody said, who was on, he had been on like three or four of the panels that I had pitched at. And he'd become like a fan, you know, a champion of mine. He's like, yo, I want you to win so bad. I cannot invest because I just don't know anything about this shit. But I know one crazy motherfucker who might do it, and his name was Dave McClure. Dave McClure was the founder of 500 Startups. So he introduced me to Dave McClure and applied to 500 Startups. And then we got into 500 Startups in early 2013. Okay, and what, what does that package look like for the audience? At that time, they give you $50,000. $50, you give them 5%. They give you... $50,000 office space and they will line you up with investors for the next like four months to try and pitch and raise money. So, so for me, 500 startups was really, really, really the kickoff because um, I didn't know investors like that. And to, to have networked and tried to meet the, the, the number of investors that I, had, that I met in 500 startups would have taken me forever. So it really, truly was an accelerator. Like, it accelerated me. Um, when I got into 500 startups, they helped you put the pitch together. And they said, go research all the angel investors out there. Get on AngelList. Make a list of 100 investors. Bring it to us. And we're going to make intros for you to whoever we can. That was, like, priceless. And in, I mean, they put me in front, you know, they put me in front of the, uh, the audience that we were trying to get to. And so by the end of that summer, we had raised like $850,000. And, wow. and the 40 that we had going into 500 startups was like, there was like $6,000 left by the time we got into 500 startups and they gave us another 50. So you leave 500 startups and you raise more money right after that, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, over the next year, we'd ra we raised like another like million and a half. Okay. How many like investors uh, did you pitch to to get that million after 500 That startups? million and a half, it just came. Like okay. I, didn't, I didn't have to, well, after 500 startups, we had $850,000 and we launched we launched the company in October of 2013. You know, by February, March of 2014, we were doing like almost quarter million dollars a month in revenue. Maybe maybe a little less, like like 200 grand a month in so revenue. So you're starting to print revenue pretty quickly. We turned this thing on, like we jumped on Instagram, you know, the, the whole business is based on acquiring hairstylists. So we would try to find hairstylists, say, hey, I'll give you a free website. It's going to have all the inventory and the hair on it. You don't have to buy any inventory, manage any of it. You just get your clients to buy. We're going to ship it directly to them, and we're going to give you a commission off everything you sell. It's, it was just, it's a perfect deal for the stylist. Like, there's no upfront money. It's all upside, right? So Yeah, would it be fair to say your average entrepreneur, they're going to take that idea, e-commerce, hair they're gonna take it b to c that yeah. the genius in your model mm -hmm. is you're taking this product and you're saying i'm coming b to b terming the stylus as another business out the gate yeah and i'm building a distribution system yeah that and yeah. that's the way i looked at it was yeah. was building a, a distribution channel not a brand not a b to c brand to me, the power is in distribution and having a platform. And then if you have a distribution channel of all these stylists, then you could sell anything through that channel. It doesn't have to just be hair. Did you ever think about me even as B2C? No. You never, there wasn't a pivot early on or nothing. It's just B2B out the gate. Yeah. Because I was selling it to the stylists. Yeah. And they were then giving it to the customer. So the way I ever just saw it was... You got you stylists need to be the 
point of distribution for this. You should be the point of sale for this. You have the advantage, right? Like you have a relationship with the customer. You should be able to convert that customer better than any place else. I will say that now where we're at in the business, we have a very heavy B2C component that we're doing. Well, we can get to it later, but we're launching something that's like massive in scale and gonna like just change the whole the whole game. And it's very B2C, but it's leveraging our entire stylist base now that we're like everywhere. Can so you we can get into it. Can you share some metrics in terms of the stylists who acquire the opportunity to generate revenue. So mm -hmm. the stylists, you're creating an ecosystem. And of course, mm -hmm. the stylists are now partnering with you and they're making money yeah. across the United States. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've signed up over 50,000 hairstylists. You have a very, very skewed distribution in terms of how much the stylists sell. So you've got... You know, like any like marketplace, you have like your power sellers, right? And then you have this very long tail of of people who just sell a couple times here and there. They'll make, you know, 50, 100 bucks extra or whatever. And then you've got like your power sellers who, you know, I think our top selling stylist in a year um, has like sold over a million and a half dollars of, of hair. Wow. Um, you know, and made, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars from from Maven. So I read that one of your inspirations was you have people outside the community in Harlem and Watts and ATL who are making hundreds of millions and in some case billions across beauty and hair, black beauty and mm -hmm. hair that these folks have been draining value out yeah. of the system and we don't get a commensurate share of yeah. that. And so uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how that provided inspiration where, hey, we have to start getting some money back in terms of all the money going out to other folks. Yeah. And I want to be like, I want to be very clear. My you know, like so, Koreans own the majority of the black beauty market. In terms of at the 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 retailers, or is that what, yes? Yeah. Uh, and at the distribution level, all the hair extension brands that are sold at the beauty supply store are also Korean owned brands, but they buy it all from Chinese factories. But then they'll only kind of distribute through their Korean owned beauty supply stores. You know, the way I look at at things is that okay they came over here they saw an opportunity they took it they've done everything in their power to keep that market and it's on us to take our market and to participate in our market you're saying don't go blame other groups who I'm are trying to eat i'm saying you if you want to you can it's not gonna help you though the blaming part of it as an entrepreneur ain't going to get you out the bed. You're still not there. focusing on You're not focused. Do for, doing for You're self. You're not focused on doing the shit. Yeah. You can, if you want to sit there and like focus on that, go ahead. If it makes you feel better to like to bitch about it, you could be right also. Like if you would if you want to be right, you could do that. If you want to get to the shit to get the money, you would probably spend less time thinking about that. Also, you know, like like I said about like the Chinese, right? Like there's something to be said for, you know, Korean immigrants at, after a war coming to America, going into neighborhoods where they don't even speak, not only do they speak the language, but the culture itself is black, completely different. And setting up shop like you can't not respect that i i don't get caught up a lot in like the yeah it's not it's not a us versus them it's the market that we feel like we should have a share in all right let's think about how to go and, and get it would you say that hey whether it's koreans or arabs 
are other immigrant groups, uh, Indians coming into hoods all across America, setting up shop, profiting, scaling their, their retail operation. The reason why they are so successful versus you don't see black people, particularly African-Americans owning those shops, is they have a knowledge of self in terms of a more intact culture. Mm -hmm. And based on our history in America, mm -hmm. we don't. We can't reach back and we don't have a lot of the good stuff that they're bringing to the table from their country of origin. Would you say that explains a lot of it? It's cultural. Yeah. It is a lot of it's cultural, and it, it's the, it's a um, there's an ethos of working together. We have yet to develop as African Americans. Like we still have so much, you know, emotional trauma to overcome to like get all that fear and anger and shit out of us to be able to like just look at one another do and it. not do be scared self. and like work together and do yeah. it right and pool resources together and and be able to think long term enough. To hold out on certain things and not immediately take the fast dollar. You know, like you have to have a little bit, you also have to have a, a long term sort of, you know, I, I think that's, you can only see as far ahead as you can see behind. And we have such little understanding of our history that we also get caught in very short term thinking. We don't look very far into the future. You know, like, Chinese and, and, and Koreans, like from my experience and like their culture, they look generations ahead and they, they're thinking about that in how they operate on a, on a day to day right now. This is part one of my interview with Deshaun Amira. Be sure to check out part two. Thanks everybody for listening to Go. You could check me out at Jamal and Martin on Twitter and also come check us out at mogulden.com. That's M O G U L D O M.com. Be sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter. You can get the latest information on crypto, tech, economic empowerment, and politics. Let's go.